Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it's March 24th, 2020, and uh, I got a question yesterday from Alan, and he asked, uh, what's your thoughts about the economy? I wrote back, I said, I'm not optimistic given our leadership. Uh, and I, I thought I'd explain my, my thinking process since Alan wanted a straight, straight answer from me. Um, I made some notes for me to, to look at. Uh, one of the good key indicators of the health of our economy is the S&P 500. You can use the Dow 30, you can use the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, NASDAQ and all, but the S&P 500 really, um, it looks at those top 500 uh, corporations and is basically, it's, it's like taking the temperature, taking the heart rate, it's a health exam, if you will, of how well our economy is actually doing and the major corporations that are that are selected that are within the S&P 500. And, and that's dropped, now the markets haven't opened yet this morning, but it's dropped probably about 30%. And given our current leadership and the global economy, I suspect it's going to drop maybe another 20%. Now, I am not an economist. Don't base anything on what I have to say I'm a scientist, <laughs> and I really like data. Uh, so that's, those are, th and I, you know, and the data sometimes really is kind of shocking and frustrating, and it, but the more that you understand the data, the easier it is for you to feel a little bit more comfortable in an uncomfortable circumstance. So everyone, I think there's so much concern right now across our country and throughout the world of glo the global economy and our own economy, especially since, you know, it's it's not a lockdown, but there's uh, encouraging people with social distances, distancing. And in New York State here, you shouldn't be out unless you're going to the pharmacy, going to the grocery store and all, because we want to... Uh, not just flatten the curve, we want to try and control this, the spread of this highly infectious disease process with good reason. And it's frustrating because unemployment is going up, people can't pay their bills, and with the, I'll call it hoarding, you know, the extreme shopping, some people can't get the foods that they, they should be able to get at this time. So the anxiety of people who are my age and older with watching their 401ks, their IRAs, getting so rapidly depleted, it's concerning. And it's frustrating when you find out, geez, the senators, after uh, having closed door meetings, in other words, not releasing this information to the public, although it did get released by uh, one of the senators, uh, that uh, something bad, as bad as, uh, as the uh, Spanish flu was about to happen, and they sold, uh, got out of the uh, riskier um, uh, stocks that they were in. Uh, insider trading, if we did it, we'd be going to prison. But for senators, that's not, not a bad thing. Then we have Senator Rand Paul, an ophthalmologist. So in medical school, you have to take infectious disease. You have to take epidemiology. You have to take statistics. So there's no excuse for Senator Rand Paul to go ahead and without any symptoms, violating all the regulations that, that our government is telling everyone, do not self-test or, or try to get a test if you have no clinical signs. He had no clinical signs, according to him. But he went ahead and took the test, like many ball players have already had the tests, when nurses and doctors and patients who need to be, be separated and say, oh, do they need to go into the isolation ward or do they need to go into a different area and have their, have their emergency procedure because they were just in a car accident done? Do we risk which group do we put them in because they could be infected? So the testing is drastically needed in the hospital situations and in the labs. There's people working with these infectious agents in the lab. Not for ball players and not for senators without clinical signs. But he tested positive. But what did he do after the time he got tested until the time he got the report back? He went to the gym, worked out, sweated all over everything, went swimming, met with other senators as well. 
and contaminated many places. Now he's in self-imposed, uh, what, he, what they're calling quarantine. It should be isolation. Isolation when you're highly, in, when you have the infection, you go into isolation. Quarantine, we don't know if you have the infection. It's suspicious. So, and then President Trump gets up there, it is, uh, uh, at his uh, communications meetings, like a press conference. Uh, the press is all sitting separate from one another with spacing in between, but he brings his, his staff out there and they're all stand shoulder to shoulder. Uh, it's getting a little bit better. There's, there's fewer of them and they're standing a little bit further apart. And so violating the social distancing uh, uh, regulations that they're telling people they have to do. Uh, so do as I say and not as I do. That's Leaders eat last and lead by example. A real leader understands a situation, does puts all of their effort into studying the situation. And if there is, there is something that he doesn't understand or she doesn't understand, that's a learning objective. That means study. You understand what's actually going on so that you can competently lead the nation or lead whatever group. I don't care if it's the Cub Scouts. And unfortunately, I don't think he could lead the Cub Scouts based on what I'm seeing. Um, I'm sorry if you're a big Trump supporter and you hate me now, uh, but I go by the data. So let me share some information with you. I want to give you some timelines and I'll put a link to a couple of videos. One is from Legal Eagles, uh, and he goes over some of the stuff in it, and he's got video clips to, to share as well. But I thought I'd go over some things. So the first thing is uh, one week uh, before uh, President Trump's inauguration, he met with Obama and, um, and key people who coordinated the whole emergency response systems there as well to do some exercises so which is always good to familiar familiarize yourself with what are considered the standard practices and responses that other administrations have have uh, utilized and what are the resources available to us and what are the general guidelines for implementing those resources. These are all essential things, all good businesses, all medical schools. These things are things that should be done. So, so a week before he met with, uh, with the uh, Obama administration and they did these role-playing exercises based on, on the, the most likely uh, critical threats to the, to the citizens of the United States of America. So one was cyber attacks, how to deal, what are, what's most likely, where could they come from, how would it, would it affect us, and so on. Hurricanes, well, President Trump has been through a couple of them now. And, you know, one of the things we learned from uh, Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico, well, it wiped out our IV bag uh, reserves as well. That should trigger something, say, well, what, what other uh, and necessary medical tools, equipment, supplies, medications are necessary if we ever have a shortage. And where or do we have redundancy? So here on our property, yes, we have all the big solar panel arrays to produce our energy. And we are grid tied, but if something happened, the power would go out. Well, we've got a great big generator to meet our needs if that happens, fortunately. But what if that generator breaks out breaks down. I didn't know it was broken down and the power goes out. Geez, well, I've got another smaller generator that could meet all of our emergency needs. What if the second backup generator goes out? Well, I've got a small battery backup system as well. And I actually have a way of recharging that with other motorized vehicles to charge those that battery backup system. So having redundancy is essential. Having one supplier, especially if some of, many of the medications and, and uh, long line catheters, um, central lines, uh, uh, different uh, types of catheters and intubation equipment and connectors and some of the emergency drugs themselves are right in the crash cart. And the crash cart is that, that place that you might see on TV, the doctor goes right to, or the nurse goes to the crash cart and hands them and they start the CPR, put an endotracheal tube, 
uh, decomp uh, or, you know, decompress a pneumothorax or, or do, it, do a cardiac uh, tap, uh, pericardial tap. All of these different things, those things are all right there in the crash cart. The epinephrine, the dopamine, all of those medications are right there. But some of them are just made in China or in India. So we need somebody in charge of our CDC, NIH, and we need coordinators to do all these things. Well, we had those things, but let me get back to the timeline. So during this, this, this uh, orientation and reviewing these three major events that can, that, that can occur, that can shut down the United States, incapacities, a cyber attack, a hurricane, and pandemics. Now, if you just look up pandemics the way many people have now, there'll be uh, TEDx speakers been talking since uh, the late 90s about it isn't a question if we'll ever get a pandemic, we will have pandemics. Now, we've been really lucky with most of the pandemics that have been here that, that, that have uh, occurred in different places, whether it's SARS or MERS or, or certainly the Ebola as well. But it's, you know, the worst is yet to come. Let me just say that. So discussions included during these exercises, these role-playing exercises, the need for ventilators, the need for vaccinations, the need for testing, the travel bans, possible coordination between uh, state and local governments. Pandemics start in international communities and with that don't respect the, the, the borders. They can spread easily. And we live in a day of international travel that's just, Every day it goes on. Science must drive the response and decision-making. A coordinated and unified message is absolutely paramount. How, how coordinated and unified are our message that we're getting from our government? Social distancing is recommended. Hospital rep uh, preparedness and responses is paramount. Funding from the Congress needs to be, f needs to be accessed immediately. Uh, collaboration between state and federal health officials is essential as well. So all of those things were worked out during this week long, uh, during this uh, uh, week prior to uh, President Trump's inauguration that, uh, that really should have driven home a, a very important message to him. It didn't take very well because in May of 2018, this is just slightly over a year after him being in office, Trump cut the, the, uh, the human uh, health, cut health and human service budget by 15%, uh, cut uh, $1.2 billion from CDC funding, cut $35 million from the Infectious, Infectious Disease Rapid Response Fund, and disband the pandemic response office, which coordinated everything from all of the different offices, which is completely, completely messed up. Some people are just starting in the last two or three days and all. So uh, everything that I just described put us in peril. And, and the message is so inconsistent. And, you know, Trump just yesterday said, what do you say? Uh, he's, uh, he's considering after this 15 days are up, so it's so we're seven or today would be day eight into the social distancing. Uh, I live in New York State, so it's, uh, we're heavily hit now. The city is much more hit than we are up here in, in central New York. But the, the disease has been transmitted uh, all over the place. And the disease, disease in New York could end up being like Italy if strong measures aren't taken. Mayor de Blasio has, uh, in New York City has uh, really been cracking down, trying to get control, getting people separated. Only people who are absolutely essential workers uh, are, are, you know, those are the truckers, the grocery stores, the doctors, the veterinarians, those sorts of things. So people need to be maintaining, be maintained in their own home, basically. And this is very nerve wracking for me. And there, you know, and I'd say Cuomo has done a really good job. He's, he's getting volunteers in from every place. And, and I'm pretty impressed with what, what our New Yorkers have done so far. A lot of us as citizens, kind of goofy, out there socializing, 
which really interferes with the process of slowing the advancement, the spread of this infectious disease. So uh, I'm going to lose my train of thought. Let me just go to uh, to China now. So on December 31st, 2019, the World Health Organization China uh, country office was informed of cases of, of pneumonia of unknown etiology. They, they, they saw that there were some cases of pneumonia. They didn't know what was causing it. Now, there was an ophthalmologist who reported this on social media around that time. I'm not sure the exact date. I I couldn't find that in my notes, uh, but the ophthalmologist reported on social media. In other words, his colleagues that he had been uh, working with uh, and gone to school with, he just let them know, this, this looks a lot like, uh, like uh, SARS. And, uh, and the local government, uh, you know, shut him down because they, they, they thought that he was, would potentially create a panic and all. Ended up, he was right. So, uh, so that's uh, December 31st that uh, they knew. So 44, case, cases, 44 case patients of pneumonia were detected between December 31st and January 3rd in Wuhan, uh, China. Then, then on, uh, between January 11th and January 12th, the World Health Organization received further detailed information from the National Health Commission of China that the outbreak is associated with the exposure uh, to one seafood market or a wet market where birds and fish and reptiles and mammals are all housed together and, and uh and uh, kept alive initially, some were already preserved, but they, uh, people would come there and say, oh, I want that duck, or I want this pig, uh, or other exotic wild animal, have them uh, um, uh, killed, and then uh, di you know, taken apart and processed so the person could take it home. So we know that those cases were coming from this one wet market, that, that the Chinese had figured that out. On uh, January 12th, the China shared the genetic sequence of this novel infection. Uh, I'm just not going to say the, uh, the virus. So it was January 12th that the Chinese had already released and shared with the um, World Health Organization the, ge the, the genome of this virus, this infectious agent which allowed the World Health Organization to go ahead and start developing tests. This is really an important uh, part, part because the CDC, the United States did not use the World Health Organization's uh, tests. We used our own, which was woefully inadequate, we had low sensitivity, the reagents weren't correct, the chemicals that were being used in, in it were bad, and that put us way behind as far as testing goes. So, uh, so on January 13th, the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand reported their first case. And uh, on January 15th, um, the Minister of Health, Labor, and Welfare of Japan re reported their case. So now, not only is it in China, it's in uh, Japan as well. And then on January 20th, it was uh, reported by the National IHR Focal Point uh, of the Republic of Korea. So they had their first case. Uh, January 20th, um, January 20th. That's when we had Thailand, China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. So now we have all of these places, and uh, on January 20th is when the CDC should have uh, adopted uh, the World Health Organization's test kit and upstreamed the manufacturing of it, gotten the labs immediately to start making it. Uh, January 24th is when I posted my first video, which is immediately taken down. And I contacted friends and, and family and saying, you know, this, this is a serious crisis. And I think it's going to affect us in the United States. 
Now, I have posted a couple of videos since then, but when that one first take down, took down, I said, okay, YouTube doesn't want anything that could potentially scare people. And I treated it like I do all my videos, just saying, this is, has gone to other borders. And if you go back and you look at, at the times, and there's videos about uh, when uh, President Trump shut down uh, the, uh, the flights to China, uh, the problem is, uh, and he calls himself a wartime president, is you don't just shut down the flights to China after it's in Japan, Korea, Thailand, and all. And, and this is the time where, where it's the major holiday of the Chinese people. There's lots of migrant workers there, and they've already flo flown to all these other places. This is just because those places had the tests, and they're able to test and detect it. Any sensible person would have realized that this is a multi-international uh, situation. We've got the brewings, we've got the seeding of, these of, of this in highly infectious and easily transmittable disease. So I'm not faulting President Trump for, sh for, for uh, banning travel to China. It should have been all international flights. And we should have, should have made sure that we, we worked with the World Health Organization to upregulate our testing. And two types of testing should have been developed at that time. So we have this, uh, this PCR test that's been done. And what that does, that's the nasal swab that goes up into the nose. And it, it, what it does is it amplifies the amount of virus particles in that sample. And then it detects it, because when you have enough of them, uh, meaning that you have it, and they amplify the numbers, you test positive, saying that you have been exposed to the infection and you have the infection. Now that test isn't gonna be effective probably for maybe 24, 48 hours, probably 48 hours after you've been exposed. And again, the incubation period, that's the time when when you actually start having symptoms, if you do have symptoms, is probably five, 5.25 days, where it could range from two days to 14 days or maybe even 15 days in some circumstances. So you could have the infection and transmit the infection rapidly. And that's a reason for the whole social distancing and staying home if at all possible, because you could have the infection and not know it. But back to the testing. So another test should have been, been uh, done. Once you have the genome, then you know what, what the body will start to produce as far as antibodies. So there's lots of people who have had the infection and they have an immune response and they have antibodies against that infectious agent. So then we do a different type of test. We take a little sample of blood and we look for the presence of those antibodies. Because if we had both of these tests right now, we could determine who needs to go into isolation, who doesn't need to go into isolation. If President Trump wants to get the company back to the country back to work, it's simple. You make sure that A, they don't have the infection with the PCR test. And then they could go in there and you'd give them a couple days in quarantine before going into the factory and they just stay in there. They don't get to go out and, and, and be, get exposed to someone else. Or the other thing that's really responsible is going ahead and, and uh, doing the serology, testing for the presence of antibodies. Because once the person has been infected and they've cured the infection and they have an appropriate antibody response, they can't get the infection again and they can't give the infection to anybody. So they're great for going to work in the places. So we should have both of those tests being ramped up like crazy. We should have the ventilator production being ramped up like crazy. Now, recently, uh, President Trump talked about uh, getting the big motor companies to make, make the ventilators and all. And he described them as these advanced and technologically uh, mysterious machines. Of course, this is a guy who was shocked that a thermometer could be infrared. Uh, so, uh, it, and I won't talk about the ventilators at this point, but ultimately one of the things to think about when we're talking about uh, ventilators is, you know, I said before that President Trump should have just said, you, you're gonna make ventilators. You, you're gonna stop making clothing and start making personal protective devices. You, I want you to start making the masks. 
make them in massive numbers by multiple different different companies. That keeps people working and could have made the supplies necessary to do these things. Getting the labs producing all of the antibody tests and the, and the PCR tests, doing both of those types of tests, getting those things ramped up, and he just sat around twiddling his fingers. And because he didn't have the orchestra, the, the, the full complement of the other people, he's exhausting, you know, a 79-year-old, uh, very knowledgeable uh, person who's, who's also out there doing all these talk shows, doing all of these interviews, trying to give accurate information, which counteracts what President Trump has been saying. So, uh, Elon Musk uh, tweeted that he'd be willing to, to try and, and get the uh, N95 masks, and I think what he did was he donated masks from either Tesla or SpaceX to, to the hospitals that needed it. He asked, he, met, he uh, contacted uh, Medtronics, the manufacturer of, of the ventilators, and I don't think he's actually made them, but he's made a whole bunch available. How do you make them available if he's a car manufacturer and a solar manufacturer, how do you get all these ventilators? I think he bought them from China. Now, wouldn't it be neat if we had someone in the White House or someone in the administration that could have done what Elon Musk did? He made some calls, got some ventilators, and got them uh, rapidly uh, tra to transferred to whichever hospitals. And I don't know the details. You'd have to go on the Twitter and see what Elon's tweets are. Uh, but that's the information, that, that isn't detailed, documented information just from a couple of tweets that I read. So back to the, to the whole market here, you know, the S&P 500 being the, a good uh, barometer or measuring device indicating the health of our, of our uh, economy and the global economy certainly affect our economy. What the president does from this point on certainly affects us as well. Um, you know, there's, as a long-term investor, meaning that I choose a stock, an individual stock, not an index fund, and select it based on the criteria that I've established by the research that I've done into that stock, uh, and it takes me a long time to do it, I just don't pick a stock right off the bat, I'm basically in it long term until it meets what, what my expectations are, and I want high expectations because I'm older, I don't have a whole life to have that uh, through compounded interest rates uh, and, and, and returns on investment, which are, you know, seven, eight, nine percent. I want doubling and tripling and quadrupling. That's what I want. So now's not a good time for me to recommend getting into the market because I don't know what, what's going to happen next. I don't think Trump knows what he's going to say the next day. Uh, whatever somebody says on Fox, he may parrot. So an example is uh, someone on Fox yesterday, for me when I'm recording this, uh, said, well, the cure could be worse than the disease. Well, a cure is never worse than a disease. A cure removes the disease. If you've got a brain tumor and you could, t you could uh, have an injection, one-time injection and, all, and it cure you, that'd be awesome. So that means it removes it. Now, could a treatment be worse than a disease? Yes, a treatment could. Hell, the treatment might, be, might have more adverse effects than any benefits. It may not do any good for the disease. And President Trump is, is, is taking drugs away from some individuals like the azithromycin, which is an excellent antibiotic, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, all of the, those medications used and then trying to parrot it like it's going to be an amazing thing. Well, someone listened to him yesterday during his uh, briefing and they went, went out and they took the, the chloroquine, which uh, is used uh, for disinfecting as well, uh, and died and their spouse is, is very ill at this time as well. So in that case, the treatment was worse than preventing the disease. So in short, this video was quite long. Uh, those are my reasons for not recommending uh, getting into the market or getting out of the market at this time. Uh, it's too volatile. The market is completely uh, being manipulated by fears. Fears of missing out. Fears on missing out of 
geez, I should I, I need to sell now before it gets any lower. And fears of missing out, geez, I wonder if it's at the bottom, now's the time I should be buying in. So those are the fears of missing out. Then you've got the day traders. People are saying, geez, look what Trump said, look what he's doing with this, managing this. It's a good time to short the S&P 500. So there's short sellers there. It's a good time to short the cruise industry, the uh, Boeing, whatever it may be. Um, so all of these things make me be very, very cautious about making any significant moves in the market. Uh, so none of what I'm saying is, uh, is uh, any recommendations for trading in the market at this point or investing in the market. Uh, I'll put a link to the Legal Eagle and maybe one of the um, uh, videos from TED, from TED Talks. Uh, regarding the pandemics and some of the recent things that we found out about in recent years that if, if handled, if we had a timely response, uh, everything we're experiencing here in the United States with the accept of global other international economies, they would have in, impacted our, our, our economy. But Americans would be working now and we'd have minimal people infected. And I hope to God we learn from this because this is in our last pandemic. And we need to be thinking about these influences. These things are impacting the development of, of uh, pandemics. It's how we, how we work with animals and the, the climate crisis that we're currently uh, going. Heaven forbid we have a hurricane or another natural disaster and we need to keep up good relations with folks because now is not the time to have a cyber attack as well. That could crush us. So uh, I don't want to end on a bad note. But I'd like everybody to think positive. Do the things that are wise to do. Social distancing. Stay healthy. Take your temperature. Do your pulse ox. If, if, if your pulse ox, that's a thing you put on your finger. I'll put a link to one from Amazon in there. And that's, that way you can see how well your lungs are oxygenating your red blood cells. You really, you know, typically you want to be like 97, 98, 99% saturation, meaning that the red blood cells went to the lungs, they got loaded with lots of oxygen, they dumped off all the carbon dioxide that's the waste product into our lungs that we exhale out. And that's a pretty good indicator if we have decreased lung function, a pulse oximetry. And, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. Sorry this is such a long video. Uh, this thing bears on my mind uh, what's going on here in the country. I just want people to take this serious, especially in the White House and our CDC, our NIH, and we need to have an orchestrated uh, and appropriate response to this situation. Thanks so much for watching, folks, and have a great day. Bye-bye now.